It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. My guest is writer, director, and musician Liam Lynch. He created the sock puppet show Syphil and Ollie, which was much beloved late at night on MTV in the late 90s. Lynch has just revived the duo after a decade off the air. You alluded to the fact that you studied with Paul McCartney. He ran or runs this performing arts uh, school. Liver- Liverpool um, Institute of Performing Arts. And um, I was in the first year that it started. And he bought his he bought the his school that he went to. He and George were students at the school. It's connected to the art building that John Lennon and Stuart Sutcliffe went to. And... Um, he purchased it because I think it was just going to be torn down or something. And the queen put in whatever he was willing to put in and, and they made this school. And I, um, I was in the very first year. So I was the first graduating class of this school. That's pretty um, solid when you have a matching grant from the queen. Yeah, that is pretty cool. Or from Paul McCartney. And then he got his sir back. He got his sir back. Yeah. So when I had classes with him, it was in a room exactly like we're in right now, which is folks were in a little soundproof, vocal booth right now and the classes were one-on-one so it was just me and paul mccartney in a room which was like being with a guy that looked exactly like paul mccartney (laughs) so and i was always so tired because i'd stay up all night that i didn't really the whole it was like funny you know i was like god dude you look so much like paul mccartney were you able to actually I mean, I, when I imagine the being in a room getting a music lesson of any kind from Paul McCartney, it, I just imagine it bouncing off of me. Like, I can't imagine learning anything from Paul McCartney. It did, wasn't, you, it wasn't, did you learn anything well, from the, the experience? Fir- the first thing that he said was, nobody can tell you how to write a song. And he said that every he never has ever known which one of, of his songs were the ones that everybody would like. And the ones that he thought were his greatest song of all times were it's like people just didn't even care you know and the ones that he wasn't sure about end up being you know these huge mega hits but he um you know so he wasn't like i'm going to tell you how to do it um but what i did learn was about a a spirit of things and um a way of thinking about things it was more about that i think but i did we would play and together and and um and he was incredibly thoughtful and helpful and um he didn't have to do that this was a time during the time when while linda mccartney was dying and and i think it was a really emotional time for him to be going in and you know spending time with some kids you know at you know but he did it and I, it was cool He he's a really complicated person he is like he's like he might be peace signs and smiles on the outside but that dude is complicated and um and he's got a really intense energy. You feel like you're like you're near a power station when you're near him. And I I think he's just got his um I think he's had so much um people trying to take energy out of him and away from him that he has almost like this calloused aura that he has a bubble around him I think to protect him from other people's energies. And when you're with him, when you're in that bubble and you're actually near him, it feels very different from when you're 10 feet away from him. It's bizarre. But he, he was great. And he, you know, the, one of the days I got there and it was raining outside and he was just sitting, looking out the window. And, and in my head, I was imagining, you know, he probably just came from the hospital here to here. Like, and you could tell he would. And, and another thing, too, is that he's in a school. He probably looked out that same window as a boy, pre Beatle. And when he was in school, in that building, at, as a boy, his mother was dying of breast cancer. His mother died of breast cancer. And now here he was. He owned the school, post Beatle, and his wife and love of his life is dying of breast cancer. So I think that he was in a weird time warp of emotions, period. Um, but he was just gazing out the window. And I went in, and I could tell he needed a moment. I put my guitar down, and I just stood by the window, and we just looked outside at the rain. And then, like, and there's part of you in the back of your mind thinking, seriously, honestly, there is some super crazy, like, Japanese Beatle fanatic that would literally pay $4 million to do what I'm doing right now. Like, just look at Rain with Paul McCartney. But, um, and so then he kind of snapped out of it and smiled. And, and I said, and I was, ta- I asked him, always asked him about Beatles. I asked him to join a Beatles cover band with me. <laughs> and I said, 
and I told him that I said the very first day I met him, I said, "You play drums, right?" He's like, "Yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, I like to play the skins or whatever." He said, "I forget what he said," but um, and and he said, "I was like, well, I don't know if you're interested, but I'm actually forming a Beatles cover band." And I know you're familiar with their work, obviously, but I need somebody to play Ringo. <laughs> and I was wondering if you'd be... In, and he just went, watch it, lad. <laughs> and he, But I think he knew right away that I wasn't like... He thought it was funny. So we were sitting there and I said, you know, what happened? I said, did you take piano lessons while you're in the Beatles? Because, you know, you started out as the guitarist and then you became the bass player. And then in the end, you were just like the piano man. It was all like, hey, Jude, and everything was at the piano. And he was like, you know, no, actually, you know, the the piano is my first instrument. My, my, you know, my mom was a piano teacher. So, so he's like, and he goes, I wrote when I'm 64, when I was 13. <laughs> and then he went over and he sat down at the piano. I'm in a room that's probably six foot by six foot with Paul McCartney and a piano and two chairs. And he played the entire song when I'm 64 for me. And I'm sitting there like, what is happening right now? I'm like, but what was crazy was hearing his voice come out of him in a room because because even if you see him live it's through a microphone through speakers through compression through all this stuff you listen to the albums it's a studio recording and most of their albums are playing at weird various speeds so their voices have different weird pitches to match up tracks and to hear the instrument in the room it was like hearing i imagine a stradivarius being played right next to your face like to hear his vocal cords sounded so much more comfortable singing rather than um, talking. It's like it was his voice is uh, amazing. Like, you, you know, it's like it gets you, it makes your hairs raise up on end when you hear it coming out of him. And then he played the whole song and he was looking at the piano the whole time. And I'm standing there looking over the piano, watching him play it. And he only looked up at me on. Like he's playing, and then he, his eyes, those big, heavy puppy eyes, look up at me on Vera, Chuck, and Dave. <laughs> but <Ba-do, ba-do, ba-do. laughs> that was the only part. But, anyways, yeah. It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. My guest, Liam Lynch, is a sock puppet auteur with uh, his show Syphil and Ollie, and a director and a musician.